3,447 may sound like a random number, but to me, it's very significant. 3,447 miles is symbolic of my journey from Honduras to Harlem. It is also symbolic of the journey that led me to doing the work that I do today as an inclusive marketing and inclusive leadership consultant where for the last decade, I have supported organizational leaders in building more inclusive workforces, workplaces, and marketplaces. But not just inclusion for inclusion's sake. The work has resulted in clients increasing the recruitment, engagement, development, and the retention of diverse talent. Yet, yeah, even with these incredible business outcomes, this work for me is very personal. It comes from a place deep, deep inside of me. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Garcia, or Sandra Garcia. I am an Afro-Latina and the owner of award-winning firm Encounter Your Potential. Today, I will share with all of you how I came to encounter my own potential. How I took my life experiences to inform, to educate, and to build inclusive leaders as my business and life's mission. But first, let me take you back into my memory banks. I attended a bilingual elementary school here in Harlem English was my second language. Spanish was my first language. I migrated to the United States from Honduras to join my mom, who had migrated years prior to join my father after meeting him on one of his business trips. They're both here. They didn't know they were going to be a part of this. <laughs> <laughs> That program was designed to help students like me transition to learning the English language while staying on pace for academics. I was about seven years old. I'm walking into a classroom. It's full of kids. There are kids everywhere. But I wasn't prepared for what I would see. I look to the right. I see black kids like me. But they're speaking English really well. I look somewhere else, and I see some brown, some white kids speaking Spanish, but what I didn't see were black kids like me speaking Spanish like me. I very realized, I very quickly realized that I was different. My classmates were also not accustomed to my difference, and so childlike curiosity led to questions. How do you speak Spanish? Where are you from? And my favorite, what are you? I wasn't equipped with the language and the words to express the difference in my own identity. So I seeked guidance and support from my parents, again. And they responded with, you are who you are. You're Latina from Honduras, and that's that. I'm sure some of you have parents who can relate uh, and give short answers, and that is that. Stop asking any more questions, that's it. <laughs> but that wasn't enough. Uh, I don't recall getting much more direction uh, or information than that. So the questions kept coming. But I also struggled with my identity for a few years. And that played out by suppressing parts of my Hispanic identity, which included not speaking Spanish as often as I could have. My parents would speak to me in Spanish, and I would respond in English. Mommy would say, terminaste tu tarea? And I would answer, yes, mommy, I'm done with my homework. If you think about it, that little girl suffered a silent, slow death of sorts. I hid parts of me that were confusing to others. 
I suppress the parts of me that would lead to questions. It became easiest for me to lean into my black identity because when I walked down the street, that part of me was undeniable. And the questions kept coming, but they only evolved over the years. At my predominantly white college, my skin would lead to questions like, Garcia, is that your adopted last name? Disrespectful. <laughs> When I made my way to corporate, the questions evolved to, Garcia, is, is your husband Hispanic? I would always answer truthfully, no, no, no. I'm 100% Latina. Garcia is my birth name. I'm just black and Latina. I'm Afro-Latina. Hmm. <laughs> The questions went on for a few more years of my corporate life until one afternoon, things changed. I'm 27 years old now. I'm a media sales and marketing executive sitting in one of my daily, and many of them, brainstorms. In this session, we're ideating how a major brand can connect with the Hispanic consumer. In this particular brainstorm session, I had an out-of-body experience. I felt alienation before, but in this particular session, it went from frustration to just a numbing experience. Ideas are flying around the table, but none are landing on me, the target audience. I'm Hispanic, I have a seat at the table, the ideas being shared are completely missing me. I would never be reached and simply wouldn't connect with any of the ideas being shared. I remind them of my background and ethnicity. I still wasn't being viewed as Hispanic. I share some examples of things that could be relevant. Still nothing. My voice and my identity was not being recognized as being a part of the very community we're trying to connect with. I felt dismissed. I felt embarrassed. The frustration and alienation led to my silence. I was at the table, but my lived experiences had no voice and therefore no value. This was a pivotal moment for me. This moment and all the moments before it led to my work today. I was fueled by not being seen by the very identity that makes up so much of who I am. The language, the arroz con pollo, Catholic mass on Sunday, the adobo and sazon we can't call a meal complete without. Yes. The bachata, which I love so much. The salsa and merengue. The deep Central American roots of the Garifuna people, which I am a descendant of. Yes, let's clap for that. I was fueled and challenged to encounter my own potential, to embrace my difference, so that I could help others encounter their own potential as well. The young professional me in that conference room became the change that I needed as that confused and embarrassed little girl struggling with her identity. And as the frustrated, aspiring executive whose voice was suppressed. I took my life and made it my mission to educate, foster, and amplify the work of inclusive leaders. Inclusive leadership, after all, is a business imperative, not just a culture benefit, but a critical piece to moving business performance and outcomes forward. 74%, that's the number of employees that report they are more effective at their job when they feel heard. 88% of employees whose companies financially outperform their competitors say they feel heard, compared to 62% of employees at financially underperforming organizations who feel unseen. 
A leader in the inclusive leadership space who I admire, Jennifer Brown, in her book lists four attributes of inclusive leaders. Their humility, empathy, vulnerability, and resilience. I like to add curiosity to that list but not the childlike curiosity that inadvertently harmed me for years. Responsible curiosity. Responsible curiosity helps adults avoid risky and potentially dangerous behaviors like cultural insensitivity, invasion of privacy, mm -hmm, I heard that mm -hmm, over there, stereotyping, performative allyship, and the emotional labor of those on the receiving end of constantly being the subject of others' curiosity and who may feel the weight of educating and explaining themselves repeatedly. I have felt this way way too many times. A responsibly curious mindset is important for leaders looking to create environments where people feel respected, valued, seen, heard, emotionally safe, and able to bring their best selves and their best work to the table. Their best work has a direct impact on your bottom line, and what leader wouldn't want to reap the benefits of an employee's best work. My best work in that moment, in that Midtown Manhattan conference room, was my lived experience. Not only as someone who identifies as being Hispanic, but as an Afro-Latina who's experiencing the world through a unique vantage point which was not considered that day. The cost of lack of inclusion is too high for leaders and too costly for organizations. It can cost you several million dollar ideas. It can cost you a new client. Or, like in my case, it can cost you the loss of a strong talent who decides to branch off and become an award-winning inclusive marketing and inclusive leadership consultant. Yes. Instead. <laughs> so, build our stronger, inclusive leadership muscles is important. So how do we do it? Let me share with you four ways how. So first, self-reflection. Start by understanding our identity and how that impacts our leadership styles. And without shame, understanding our biases, recognizing that we have them, recognizing which we have, and then also doing the work to overcome them. Second, measure progress. Regularly assess your efforts to becoming a more inclusive leader. And also know that becoming is active. You can't manage what you don't and what you won't measure, but what you measure gets done. So measure progress often, it's essential, and know that it's ongoing. Third, share your journey. There is strength in vulnerability. Invite others into your journey towards becoming a more inclusive leader. Give vulnerability, and you give liberty to the people around you to be themselves, to bring themselves, and to be able to bring the unique perspectives which makes ideation, brainstorm, development rich and rich. <laughs> Lastly, be patient but persistent. Becoming a more inclusive leader takes time and it takes effort. So stay the course. Many small moments lead to big, big impact. And while you're at it, celebrate your wins. Every small step leads to positive change, can lead to positive change. 
When you move in an inclusive manner, you help someone feel seen. Seven-year-old me, 27-year-old me would thank you. Today, 37-year-old me and seven-month-old him <laughs> We challenge all of you to get out there and to encounter your inclusive leadership potential. Thank you.